Let me again uh, welcome you this evening and introduce myself. I'm Kerry Kalanisi, and I am the uh, Edward Schills Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also a professor in our political science department, and I am uh, privileged to direct the Penn Program on Regulation, which I'll talk a little bit about. I thought at the outset I would just let you know that uh, I'm an academic, but uh, as much as I have the world of academe and scholarship uh, as part of what I do, uh, I, I, I see myself also engaged in two other very important pursuits. One is teaching, and the other is outreach uh, to the world at large, and trying to uh, bridge uh, what we know in the world of scholarship and research uh, with the world of practice to make uh, regulation uh, better. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, today uh, is uh, set up uh, the next three days by offering an overview of why we're here. Uh, as I said, I, I direct the Penn Program on Regulation. And this program brings together about 30 faculty affiliates from across the University of Pennsylvania. And the University of Pennsylvania is a private institution. It's an Ivy League institution based in Philadelphia. Uh, and our faculty uh, that are affiliated with this program work across all different fields of regulation, from telecommunications uh, to environmental regulation, uh, and everything in the mix. Uh, we also have a particular emphasis on what I call cross-cutting issues, issues that are of common to regulators in any field of endeavor uh, and anywhere in the world. Regulators around the world are managing uh, their institutions and their workforce, building human capital. Uh, regulators around the world are engaging with members of their publics. Uh, and regulators around the world are enforcing uh, regulations. So we have had a number of projects uh, ranging from work on collaborative uh, rulemaking to open government and transparency issues uh, to some uh, very interesting work about using uh, algorithms and machine learning to increase the effectiveness of regulatory enforcement targeting. Uh, and, and, these, and, and these and other issues, whether it's uh, use of risk analysis and benefit cost analysis, are some of these cross-cutting issues that, that we have tended to focus on and we've produced a number of books over the last several years on some of these cross-cutting issues, whether it's uh, new uh, challenges that regulators in the uh, developed world face about the safety of consumer products uh, from imports or, uh, from abroad to uh, issues about uh, systematic breakdown of regulatory systems to even questions about the relationship between regulation and employment. And certainly with uh, the uh, global recession and one that we've certainly felt uh, a great deal in the US, uh, that's been an issue uh, that we've taken a look at and produced some books on recently. Uh, we're here today uh, to talk about excellence in regulators. So I thought I'd start by just asking uh, us to think about what is it that makes a regulator a regulator. When we're talking about what it means to be a best-in-class regulator or an excellent regulator, what is it that we mean? Uh, now around the world there are a whole host of institutions uh, that are regulators. What is it that they do and what do they have in common? Well I wanted to just start by talking about some of those things to set a context for the next three days. And then we'll get into a little bit about what uh, we're doing is, and, and where today's uh, session and the next couple of days discussion fits into the larger project that we're engaged in. So a regulator, I think, uh, can be thought of as a public institution that implements and enforces laws and policies. Uh, and is, in that sense, charged with solving problems uh, that are consistent with its mission and, and mandate that it's been given. And in, it does so by steering and shaping the behavior of others. Uh, others, uh, individuals, but also other organizations as well. So the work of a regulator uh, is one that's interactive from its very nature, uh, interactive with 
uh, those uh, who are subject to the rules that it enforces and implements, uh, but also uh, interacting with all of the public that is uh, affected by those. So what does a regulator do? I think it's important to see that regulators, uh, again, around the world will uh, do a number of things that are in common. They all have to set priorities. There's a lot of problems out there to be solved and regulators uh, often have limited resources and they have to make choices just like much of uh, what we all have to do in our own lives. We have to set priorities and then make decisions. Uh, and sometimes those decisions involve setting uh, new rules or directives or guidelines, uh, but other times those decisions involve uh, ones about uh, the other actions that regulators take. Regulators, in addition to making decisions, they also communicate. They communicate about those decisions and they engage with others in the making of those decisions. I don't know of any regulator around the world that uh, is all the time just holed up in its office. Uh, there is a, a, some kind of communication process. If nothing else, uh, those who are subjected to the rules that uh, a regulator uh, is implementing uh, need to know about them. Uh, that's, uh, that's an essential uh, part of communication as well. Uh, but they also it, it do this not just for the sake of, of uh, enforcing laws, but to actually solve problems. And they, they solve problems by interpreting and, and applying those rules, uh, but also by seeking compliance and using incentives, and whether that's just uh, education and outreach, uh, or whether it's through other uh, means, including enforcement actions. And finally, uh, at the end of all that the regulator does, if, from starting from setting a priority and making decisions and solving problems and shaping incentives, regulators also are evaluating all of those things and to varying degrees, uh, but trying to learn uh, how to do uh, better. Uh, that's something that a regulator also does. So a regulator, so far we've defined in terms of what it does. Uh, I also want to introduce four common features. I think most regulators, again around the world, share these four common features. And there may be more uh, as well, but just to set the stage here, I think it's important to remember uh, these four common features. First of all, regulators are given a mission. They're public institutions. They've often been created by a government to do a certain thing, okay? And they've got a mission. And that mission generally encompasses a public interest mission, but also a specific mandate that the regulator's been given. Uh, a second common feature is that because they are working on interpreting and applying rules, often in very particularized situations, maybe inspecting facilities that are in remote locations, but also because they're operating on often very um, complex technical issues, uh, maybe even a little bit out of the uh, uh, out, out of the, uh, the, the, the main public eye. Uh, regulators, for whatever reason, do have some discretion in how they go about this priority setting and decision making and everything else. Uh, but at the same time, they also have accountability. And uh, because they're separate institutions, they have uh, that degree of discretion, but they have accountability. Accountability to, to whom? Other governmental entities and authorities, those that legislatures and parliaments and that set up regulators. Uh, also accountability and interaction with the entities that they regulate, with the various rights holders and community interests that are affected by what they do. The overall public has a way of uh, keeping uh, some accountability as well. I think all regulators have this to varying degrees. A third uh, feature uh, is that the work that regulators do in steering and shaping the behavior of others 
leads them into contact with a wide variety of regulated entities. Uh, a variety in a number of different ways. Some may be individual actors. Some may be very large, complex organizations. Another thing about regulated entities is that they are often themselves producers of social value. They're, they are, whether it's uh, producing goods or services that other people value, uh, employment opportunities that people value, uh, there are other things that are going on. A regulator often uh, is not eliminating entirely an activity, but regulating it, meaning moderate it, uh, keep it within some bounds. Why? Because the, within some of those bounds, there are things that people value. Airplane travel is something we all enjoy, but it is regulated to ensure uh, that there is um, a modicum of safety. And it is also the case, say, with airplane travel, uh, that there are varying degrees of capacity on the part of regulated entities to achieve the goals that the regulator has set out uh, to uh, pursue. Uh, the, sometimes that capacity comes with a real alignment of uh, interests. Uh, airlines want to make sure that they run their air transport systems in a safe way so that they have customers. Uh, there's an alignment in some many settings between the private interest and the broader public interest. Uh, but there's also varying degrees of capacity to just simply do what society is expecting uh, be done. Uh, some firms have that capacity in a regulated environment when other firms maybe uh, do not. So that's, that's, that is part of uh, uh, the complexity, actually, which is the fourth feature of a regulator. Uh, oftentimes, uh, regulators actually are handed the more challenging work. The legislatures may well adopt mandates that are broad and general, maybe even platitudinous, things that everybody can agree with, and then it's left up to the regulator to figure out how to actually uh, get the rubber to meet the road, uh, so to speak. And in that process, uh, regulators are confronting often complex technologies and technological issues. Uh, they're also interacting with complex social systems as well, from those large organizations to the way that the large organizations may be embedded with uh, local communities and with larger regional economies. Uh, and ultimately, uh, regulators are often bumping up against trade-offs as well uh, in society. Uh, actual, uh, maybe in, in some cases, trade-offs between one kind of risk and another kind of risk. Uh, which do we prefer? So that w what we hope to do today and, and, and certainly in the next couple of days is, is talk about how entities that face these kind of common features, uh, and I would submit that the AER shares many of these uh, common features as well, uh, how they go about thinking about what it means to perform in an excellent manner. What does it mean to achieve excellence, to achieve a best-in-class status, uh, confronting these kinds of basic uh, uh, challenges. Now, when we started off this project, uh, we uh, organized our work around a model of regulatory performance that has four key elements. And because we're from the University of Pennsylvania and I direct the Penn Program on Regulation, uh, it just so happens that these four key factors we've labeled all with four Ps. Uh, but it starts at the top with priority setting, making those uh, initial choices about where to focus one's attention. Uh, and, uh, and that moves along down this uh, uh, vertical axis here uh, toward actual problem solving. The actual uh, 
uh, issuing of rules or, or statements or making uh, adjudicatory decisions or enforcement actions, going out and actually um, doing the work of, of a regulator. But also along this horizontal dimension, there's two other important Ps. One is people. People uh, within the organization, within the regulatory organization, how uh, they're managed, how they're trained, uh, how they're led. Uh, and then the other P is the public, uh, which uh, refers to the external world, external from the regulator's perspective. Uh, and that's all of you uh, here. Uh, ultimately, uh, these combine uh, to uh, lead to the outcomes in the world. Outcomes in terms of safety, uh, risk reduction, uh, outcomes in terms of administrative uh, processing and, and other cost and burden either being high or low. The outcomes may be good or bad, but they're going to, we are thinking, operate on uh, a basis of how all those four things are working together. Okay, so uh, we proposed back in, uh, I think it was August of, or so of last year, a proposal based upon those uh, key factors uh, that affect regulatory performance. And we proposed this to the AER in response to a call for proposals, a competitive process that the AER issued, and there were a number of other entities, uh, organizations, probably universities, uh, that were also uh, putting in proposals. And, and, and ours was accepted last fall, and we've begun uh, our, our process of working on this project in earnest around uh, uh, early November. Uh, and what I'd like to do is just say a few words about what we are doing as part of the best-in-class regulator initiative, and then s suggest how this uh, gathering that we have here today fits into our low overall, overall project. So the best-in-class regulator initiative I should say a word about what it is and a word about what it isn't. What is it? We are charged uh, in responding to the call for proposals and, in, and according to the proposal that we put forward to develop a framework of excellence uh, to come up with uh, and identify attributes of best in class or excellent regulatory uh, performance in a, in, 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 a, in the overall sense, and then to uh, develop uh, recommendations about how a regulator like the AER can go about uh, striving to achieve or improve on those uh, dimensions of excellence. And also, importantly, how it can go about uh, determining how well it's doing in that quest in pursuit of excellence. Now, what that means in a sense uh, is that we're creating a structure uh, and a set of recommendations uh, about how to use the structure to go about uh, uh, pursuing excellence. It is, from the very start, designed to be a general structure that could be useful for the AER but also useful for other uh, energy extraction uh, regulators around the world uh, or other regulators in other, or other realms. Uh, because it's de designed to both reflect uh, overall best practices in the global sense, but also uh, reflect uh, the concerns and values that are shared by uh, many across uh, the province here in Alberta. What it isn't, what this project isn't, is it's not a report evaluating the AER. We're not grading the AER. Uh, we're not uh, digging in and finding out what it's doing well or what it's not doing well. Uh, we're not going to pass judgment on the AER. But what we develop can be used both by the AER or by others as a way of structuring an inquiry into 
some kind of evaluation of where the AER is. Uh, in that sense, what I like to say is that we're creating uh, the syllabus <laughs> Uh, or, or rubrics uh, for those educators out there, rubrics for grading, uh, but we're not actually doing. Uh, any regulator, the AER, will need to pick up what we develop, pick up the syllabus, if you will, and do the reading. <laughs> and they'll need to fill in gaps, and they'll need to make it apply to their circumstances uh, and, 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 and be able then to put it in place. Uh, but I wanted to make clear that it's still something that's what's, that we want to make sure fits well with and accommodates and reflects the views of all of you here in the room and the broader public in Alberta as best we can. Now, uh, we have three main parts to this, re this, this overall project. And I wanted to just say a few words about each of these to give you a sense of what we've been doing, uh, where we're headed, uh, with a report that should be released ultimately uh, with recommendations this summer. The first uh, part of what we're doing is engaging in research. Now remember those four P's that I talked about, priority setting, problem solving, people, and the public. Uh, we have actually uh, commissioned a series of in-depth research papers organized around uh, those four core papers that are synthesizing the available uh, research literature to find out what we can say about uh, the best practices in all those four areas. We also have produced and probably within the next couple of weeks even we'll have issued out on our website an analysis of regulator strategic plans. Uh, nine different countries around the world, uh, 21 or 20 reports, we've, we've studied the strategic plans of regulators themselves and, and tried to extract from those the attributes that those regulators have set for themselves, those aspirations that they've set for themselves in terms of pursuing excellence. Uh, and finally, uh, we're going to be producing an edited volume that will be out actually uh, a little bit uh, after the project is done in early uh, 2016. We expect it will be published by the Brookings Institution Press that develops um, uh, 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 the views of about a dozen or so international experts on regulation, again, from around the world, and their views about what makes a regulator excellent. Some of their early thoughts about that question are already up on our website, thebestinclassregulator.org. And you can, if you haven't seen them yet, uh, peruse those at your, at your leisure. Those papers will be expanded uh, later into a book. So that's one thing that we're doing. Uh, the, the, the other thing that we are doing is engaging in what is called expert elicitation. Uh, that is trying to uh, identify uh, from experts and extract from them uh, the advice that we can uh, about what defines regulatory excellence and how uh, to measure it. Uh, and toward this end, uh, last uh, month, uh, we convened a workshop, a dialogue with uh, experts from uh, Europe, the Middle East, uh, North America, uh, Australia, uh, both academics as well as we had a number of perspectives from uh, environmental groups and uh, from, uh, from some industry uh, uh, experts as well. We had a, a, a robust dialogue at the University of Pennsylvania Law School in which we uh, focused on defining and measuring regulatory excellence. And as I said before, the draft uh, uh, discussion papers the experts prepared are online. Uh, we've had a number of other seminars and meetings, and upcoming, at the end of all of what we're doing, we'll subject our report to a peer review process as well. Uh, finally, though, and not, not at all the least, we've been spending a lot of time uh, and interest in hearing uh, the views of those who are interacting with uh, the AER. Uh, I spent uh, several weeks here earlier this year uh, uh, and, and late last year uh, in one-on-one -on -one meetings with various uh, uh, folks who have different 
perspectives on uh, the work of the AER. Uh, in addition, uh, we, as, as Jim had mentioned, uh, ha convened just a, a couple of weeks ago uh, a dialogue session in Edmonton with a variety of Aboriginal uh, community uh, members. And finally, of course, this occasion here. Uh, this is a very important part of our overall uh, st strategy here. And what we are hoping to get out of this, our goals for the next three days are first and foremost to listen and to learn. And so the uh, members of our Penn team will be listening uh, and we may be taking, we'll be taking notes. Uh, we're going to be processing all that we hear here today and tomorrow and the next day. And we really, really appreciate you taking your time uh, to help in this way. We want to listen and learn about your thoughts about what are the attributes of excellence and about also what you would like to see to be convinced that a regulator, that the AER, is actually demonstrating progress toward or achievement of excellence. Uh, and they, these are your thoughts, your ideas here will indeed inform our recommendations.